Uh, thank you very much. So first, let me begin by apologizing. Juan asked me to give this talk, specifically to uh, give a talk which was directed at an audience of physicists. And as I was preparing this talk, I realized that I don't really know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a talk, which is really the same talk that I would give to an audience of mathematicians. But you should feel free to interrupt me if I'm not making sense. Um, I'd like to begin with a little bit of history. And I noticed that in the second row here, we have one of the principal actors in the story that I'm going to be telling. So if I get the history a little bit wrong, feel free to correct me. So, all right. yeah, I said all over the All right. So uh, the story I want to start with is in the late 80s with a question that Natia asked about the Jones polynomial. So the Jones polynomial is an invariant of a knot. And it was constructed by Vaughn Jones. And his construction made use of a particular way that you could represent a knot. You can always represent a knot in three-dimensional space by drawing a braid and then closing up the ends. So he gave a construction which made use of a braid and then checked that this was independent of the particular representation that he chose. And Atiyah asked if this was actually necessary or if there was some construction that you could give that was intrinsically three-dimensional, that really just used a knot in three-dimensional space and extracted this invariant, the Jones polynomial. So this was answered by Whitney, who introduced something called quantum chern simons theory. So quantum chern simons theory is an example of a topological quantum field theory. And it comes to you with a huge number of interrelated invariants that you can try to compute. And, uh, what Whitman showed is that if you choose a couple of very simple examples of things that you could try to compute, what would pop out is values of the Jones polynomial evaluated at roots of unity. So that gave a sort of physical interpretation of what the Jones polynomial is, and uh, also suggested that the theory of the Jones polynomial is really just a small fragment of some much larger story that people got very excited about. So um, in particular, Atia got excited about it and motivated by this and several other examples, made an attempt to communicate back to mathematicians uh, what this elaborate structure was about. So that that's, um, definition is where I want to begin the story. So this is Atia's definition of what a topological quantum field theory is. So um, fix a dimension D. I'm going to describe what I'll call a TQFT in dimension D. Um, maybe some people would say it's a, in dimension D minus one plus one. So a TQFT is a rule which does the following. Maybe let me give this a name. The rule is Z. So to every closed D minus one manifold, you assign Z of M which is a complex vector space. And to every bordism of D minus one manifolds. So a bordism, let me remind you, Here's a picture of a bordism. A bordism means a D manifold whose boundary, which has boundary, and whose boundary is divided into two pieces, an incoming piece and an outgoing piece. Um, so I'll write B for the bordism. And to say that it's a bordism is to say that the boundary of B is written as a disjoint union of two pieces M and N. And here by this bar, I'll mean that I'm giving M the opposite orientation. And 
you assign a what I'll write as z of b, it's a map of, from z of m to z of m, which is a complex linear. Um, well, this is, first of all, subject to a couple of rules for what happens when you glue bordisms. So first of all, if I take z of m cross the interval 0, 1, that's something that you can think of as a bordism from the manifold m to itself. And this is supposed to be the identity map. Uh, vector space z of m to z of n. And if you have two bordisms, let's say, let's say you have manifolds m0, m1, and m2 of dimension d minus 1. Let's draw them as if they're one dimensional. And then suppose that you have bordisms from and bordism from M0 to M1 and a bordism from M1 to M2 as drawn in this picture. Well, then you can glue them together along this common copy of M1 and make a bordism from uh, M0 to M2. Let me call this B and B prime. And in this situation, um, the linear map that you're supposed to assign to this glued together object um, is supposed to be the composition of the two linear maps associated to the individual constituents. And finally, there's a, a rule that says that when you decompose something as a disjoint union, then you're supposed to take tensor products of the corresponding vector spaces. So if I take a disjoint union of finitely many compact manifolds of dimension d minus one, this invariant is supposed to be identified with the tensor product of the individual constituents. Uh, the sort of degenerate case of that is if this is the empty collection of manifolds. So what z is supposed to assign to the empty manifold is the tensor product of the empty collection of vector spaces, which by convention is the complex numbers. And well, there are some additional axioms that I should write down about how these isomorphisms behave. Uh, first, they should be compatible with these linear maps and they should be suitably um, behave well with respect to permuting the factors and so forth. I'll leave those to your imagination. So this was Atiyah's definition. Um, now you can summarize this definition very efficiently. Um, in the language of category theory. So let me, if you fix a dimension D, there's a category, which I'll denote by Cobb D. So this is the category whose objects are closed D minus one manifolds. And Morphisms are given by ordisms of D minus one manifolds. That is morphism from, uh, for example, two circles to one circle is a, is a picture like this. Um, and let's say morphism, we consider two morphisms to be the same if the total spaces of the ordisms are diffeomorphic. And so uh, a efficient way of stating this is that uh, definition CQFT is a tensor vector from this category called D to the category of complex vector spaces. Saying that it's a functor is everything that I said up to this point and saying that it's a tensor functor, well, it means that it preserves tensor products where on the left-hand side, what tensor product means is disjoint union. So it takes disjoint unions of manifolds to tensor products of complex vectors. I have a question. So what, yeah, think about the category. Mm -hmm. So these morphisms, are, um, are they supposed to be maps like they are here or are... are uh, I'm sorry, in this category? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the morphisms in this category are bordisms. So 
here's a in COB2, this is. Yeah, I guess my question is morphism sounds like it's some kind of map between one thing and another. Right. But here it's just some space that joins the two. There's no sense. In I mean, I guess in most, most times that you give an example of a category, the morphisms in that category are something that you can think of as maps that preserve some structure. But this is an example of a category which, you know, a priori you don't think about that way. I mean, category just means there's some composition law which is associative, and that's true of this gluing law for boards. Um, so maybe a remark that I should make at this point um, that this has many variants. Depending on what kind of manifold you want to be talking about. So I have been implicitly so far and will continue implicitly in this uh, lecture to assume that when I say manifold, I mean a manifold with an orientation and no additional structure. Uh, but you could have other conventions. So you could consider um, unoriented manifolds. Oriented manifolds, you could consider oriented manifolds, you could consider spin manifolds. Um, and which variant that you want to consider would depend on which particular example that you wanted to get. So, if, for example, if you were interested in quantum Chern Simons theory, then oriented manifold is not quite enough to have these invariants. You need some additional structure like a, a framing or a P1 structure. Uh, in order to make the invariants that you're interested in unambiguous. Um, so I'm going to stick for most of this lecture to talking just about oriented manifolds, although the fact that there are many variants is going to come up at the very end, uh, assuming that we get there. Okay, so uh, just to get us all on the same page, I want to do the example. When is equal to two. Okay, so let's um, try to understand the structure that we see when we have one of these rules. Well, first and foremost, we have to assign a vector space to every closed manifold of dimension one. Now, closed manifolds of dimension one are very easy to classify. Right? A, a connected closed manifold of dimension one is a circle. And a general closed manifold of dimension one is just a disjoint union of finitely many circles. So if you have one of these uh, TQFTs, you could evaluate it on the circle and you would get some um, complex vector space, which I'll denote by A. And once you know what you just want to assign to the circle, you know what you want to assign to any closed manifold of dimension one, for example, those you took three circles, well, because Z is supposed to send disjoint unions to tensor products, this would just assign a tensor product of three copies of A. Of course, you're not done at this point, because in order to, um, to find a functor, you have to say not just what it does on the objects, but also what it does on the morphisms, what it does to bordisms between manifolds of dimension one. So there's a particularly interesting picture that you can draw, which I've already drawn once and I'll draw again, is this, this manifold with boundary called a pair of pants. It's a, you can regard it as a bordism from two circles to a single circle. And if you evaluate Z on this, you get something which I'll call M. It's a linear map from A tensor A into A. And let me just remark that the axioms uh, imply that M is commutative and associative. 
I chose the letter A because this thing is going to end up having the structure of an algebra. There's also a unit for this multiplication. So you can evaluate Z on a disk, and I'm going to think of the disk as it's a manifold whose boundary is, uh, is a circle. I'm going to think of that circle as outgoing. So this is this disk is a bordism from the empty manifold to the circle. That gives you a linear map from Z of the empty manifold to Z of the circle. And uh, Z of the empty manifold, remember, is the complex numbers, and Z of the circle is A. So this you can just think of as an element of A. And this element is the unit. I think you made the, the image of one is the element of A. Yes, you, you identify a linear map with an element of A by evaluating it at the element Y. So this is the unit for the uh, multiplication of A. Also think of the circle, or sorry, the disk, as a bordism in the other direction. You can regard that boundary circle as an incoming circle rather than an outgoing circle. If you evaluate Z on the disk drawn this other way, this gives you instead a map from A to the complex numbers. I'll write this as TR for trace. And so a rule of thumb that someone once gave me for a math talk is that every talk should have at least one proof in it. I'm going to apply this rule here. I'm going to prove this one thing because it, it's kind of going to come up several times in this lecture. So a lemma that this, um, this trace map gives a non-degenerate pairing. So if I look at A tensor A, mapping to A by multiplication, and then mapping to the complex numbers via the trace. So this is a bilinear form on A. Um, this gives an isomorphism from A to its dual. And we just remark as an aside, this implies that A has to be finite dimensional. When I say dual here, I mean dual in the purely algebraic sense. And so if uh, A was an infinite dimensional vector space, its dual space would be an even bigger infinite dimensional vector space. So what's the proof of this? So this linear map from A tensor A to the complex numbers it's what Z assigns to a particular picture. And with the multiplication is associated to this picture. And then if I want to compose that with the trace, I just cap it off on the other end with a disk. In other words, I'm looking at Z of a cylinder, but I'm thinking of the cylinder as having two incoming circles. Of course, there's another picture I could draw, which is I could think of that same cylinder pointed the other way. I can imagine that there's a cylinder with two outgoing circles. So this gives me a map from the complex numbers into A tensor A. And this in particular is a linear map from the dual A back into A. So so this bilinear form I could think of as a map F from A to its dual. This construction gives you a map from the dual of A back into A. And my claim is that these maps are actually inverses of one another. Claim F composed with G is uh, the identity map from A to itself. And the proof is a proof by picture is that F composed with G is something that you can get as Z evaluated on a particular shape. Namely, you would take Z 
and you would evaluate it on the picture that you get by uh, drawing this and attaching it to this and thinking of it, that thing as a bordism from one circle to itself. And then um, let me observe that this is uh, the same as Z evaluated on just the straight cylinder. This is a, a diffeomorphism invariant. So actually we want it more slowly for how this is, which of the two pieces are F and G in the picture? Right, so, so I, I have a map from A to, so how was F constructed? F was constructed essentially by using this cylinder, this, this piece here, and uh, evaluating Z on it and getting a map from A tensor A to the complex numbers. And similarly, G was obtained by evaluating, so let me write an F there. G was obtained by evaluating Z on this cylinder here, bordism from the empty set to two circles. And uh, well, that's an element of A tensor A. So if A is finite dimensional, that's the same thing as a map like this, but in general, it gives you a map like this. And the claim is that if you unwind the definitions of what it means to now compose F with G, that it's going to be given by um, stacking the pictures next to each other, just like this. Let me leave this as a, an exercise to think through. So uh, actually, and let me just note, we've, we've proven something that's true in general and that we're going to use again later. So in any dimension, is it what's that? So nothing that I, um, in the definition that I've given involves complex conjugation on the complex numbers. I could have replaced the complex numbers by any vector space. Okay. And yeah, so this dual means not the Hermitian dual, it means the linear dual. Okay, so in any dimension, the same argument. Shows that if you evaluate Z on some manifold and give it the opposite orientation, that this is, can be identified with the dual space of Z evaluated on manifold M itself and both are finite dimensions. Okay, so uh, let's go back to dimension two. So Atiyah's axioms tell you, you have this vector space A, it has a commutative and associative multiplication, and it has this trace map, which gives you a non-degenerate pairing. So that structure has a name. So you get, um, A, or let's say A, is what's called a commutative for So this term just means all the structure that we just saw. It's a vector space with a multiplication, which is commutative, associative, and unital, and a trace map, which is non-degenerate in this sense. And I don't know who to attribute this to. I think it's a folk theorem it is that the converse is true. It's also true, namely any commutative Frobenius algebra um, can be extended, or let's say comes about in this way. The data of a two-dimensional TQFT in the sense of a TS definition is exactly the same as the data of this particular algebraic structure. So 
Here we analyzed uh, TQFTs in dimension two by emphasizing the value that they take on a manifold of dimension one. In this case, the only manifold, interesting manifold to consider is the circle. Um, but another point of view that you could take is that what's interesting is instead to emphasize what these invariants do on manifolds of the highest dimension. So um, let's return to the case of a general TQFT in any dimension. Um, if M is a closed manifold, dimension D, and Hewitt has a bordism from the empty manifold to itself. So if we have one of these TQFTs, we're allowed to evaluate it on M, and we get a linear map from Z of the empty manifold to Z of the empty manifold. This is just the complex numbers. This is the complex numbers. And this map is just given by multiplication by a particular scalar. And I would use notation by just calling that scalar Z of M. So one point of view is that first and foremost, TQFT and Z is an invariant of closed D methods. Sorry, so thus far you've been using um, consistently M as a Notation for D minus one dimensions and B for the D dimensions. But yeah, if you want to change, just, just change, change that. Right? Instead. Same, same story. So if you believe this folk theorem here, it's telling you that in particular, if you have a commutative Frobenius algebra, then you can extract from it an invariant of closed two manifolds. What the folk theorem says, A is a commutative Frobenius algebra. Um, comes from a TQ of TZ, and then I can evaluate Z on a surface sigma, and I get some number. And well, we understand what closed surfaces look like pretty well. Um, a closed surface which is connected is just determined by its genus. And so here are some examples. So what happens when you evaluate Z on a sphere? So let me draw that sphere this way. Well, I've, to emphasize that it was a sphere, I drew a little um, equator here. And that equator is giving you a recipe for cutting the sphere into two pieces. And well, that decomposition tells you exactly what to do in order to extract this number. Namely, the first piece, the, uh, the half sphere that's on the left is a bordism from the empty set to the circle. And that corresponds to the identity element in A. And the second piece is what you evaluate Z on in order to get the trace. So the complex number that you would get by evaluating on this surface of D is zero is just the trace of the element one. So that's certainly a complex number that you can extract whenever you have a commutative Frobenius algebra. You can evaluate Z on a surface of uh, genus one on a torus. And well, we'll leave this to you as an exercise. 
the complex number that you extract in that case is actually an integer. It's the dimension of A as a vector space. And well, you can try to play this game in general. I don't think you get something that has a name, but it's certainly something which is an invariant of this Frobenius algorithm. So what happens if you, for example, you wanted to evaluate this on a surface of genus two depicted like this? Well, in order to figure out what complex number to associate to it, you would cut this circle, cut this, uh, sorry, genus two surface into pieces where you know what Z is supposed to be doing. So here I've drawn some circles that you can cut along. And if you cut along these circles, you will cut this um, surface into, it looks like six pieces. Two of those pieces are disks and four of them are pairs of pants. And so this, you would get a complex number that was obtained by composing some linear maps that you can understand if you understand the A as a Frobenius algebra. So this is, well, let's say this is something. This is a complex number. And the content of this folk theorem is essentially that the complex number that you extract via this procedure doesn't depend on the particular way that you drew these circles. So getting back to this point of view, let's say you imagine that first and foremost, what you're interested in is the numbers that you get by evaluating Z on manifolds of dimension D. So we're, you have more structure than that. And what does that additional structure buy for you? It buys a set of tools that you can use to compute those numbers. So here, um, if you wanted to evaluate Z on the surface of genus G, well, you figure out what that is by cutting that surface of genus G along a co-dimension one submanifold into pieces, which are somehow easier to understand. And in dimension two, that's a very powerful toolkit. Um, because uh, first of all, if a manifold has dimension two, it's co-dimension one submanifolds have dimension one. So we understand exactly what they look like. And a manifold of dimension two, you can really simplify it a lot by cutting it along circles. Is it obvious that it doesn't depend on how you cut it on the circles in the definitions of the... What's that? The answer is not supposed to depend on... The answer is not supposed to depend I understand on. that from the topological theory point of view, this is clear, mm -hmm. but does it follow from the, the, the list of axioms that Atiyah gave? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the list of axioms that Atiyah gave said that Z of this picture, first of all, is it's one of the pieces of data that is in the definition of a TQFT. And the fact that it's given by composing Z of the individual pieces is one of the axioms for how these invariants behave. But may, maybe your question is really, um, you're wondering about the folk theorem. Like if I think, if I really start- I'm wondering whether I cut it this way or I can draw the surface in some other way and I cut it in some other way and I get the answer. I, 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 well, that was well from a T's definition, that's a requirement. Ah, okay. But okay, um, the fact that you just knowing, um, if you know what you want to assign to a pair of pants and a disc and you demand a couple of easy compatibilities between them, that that enforces all the other compatibilities that com might come from more complicated pictures, that's, that's the content of that assertion. Um, let me comment that um, the, it, a complete proof that if you start with a commutative Frobenius, finite dimensional associate of Frobenius algebra, that it doesn't depend on the cutting has been, it is available. It's complete, it's, com it's written out, it's on the archive. Uh, so who, uh, who should I attribute it to? Um, not the theorem, which was known to physicists for ages, but uh, the actual proof was given by myself, Greg Moore and Graham Siegel in our, in our paper in 2004. We have, an, we have an appendix where we use Morse theory and, and give you know, a very careful proof of this. All right, so um, you can think you're primarily interested in these numbers. 
but the additional structure of this um, tensor functor is a toolkit for computing these numbers. And in dimension two, it's a very effective toolkit because you can really simplify two manifolds by cutting them into pieces. But for manifolds of high dimension, that's really not true. A high dimensional manifold, uh, first of all, co-dimension one submanifolds can look very complicated. And if you're letting yourself only cut along closed submanifolds of co-dimension one, then you can't necessarily um, simplify things very much. So uh, for this reason, um, various people have proposed uh, enhancing Atiyah's axioms. And actually, to motivate this, maybe I should um, just say one brief word about uh, like what's an example of how you could use uh, Atiyah's axioms to uh, compute one of these numbers. So let's say V is a closed manifold. Dimension D. And suppose that you cut it into two pieces, B minus and B plus, along some uh, co dimension one submanifold M. So then Z of this B minus, well, that's a B minus is a bordism from the empty manifold to M. Uh, that gives you a linear map from the complex numbers into Z of M, which you can just think of as an element in this vector space, Z of M. And similarly, Z of B plus is something that you can think of as an element in the dual space of Z of M. Equivalently, Z of M with the opposite orientation. And then if you wanted to evaluate Z on the entire manifold B, what you would get is you would just take, um, take this vector Z of B minus, which is in some vector space, and this vector Z of B plus, which is in the dual space, and then pair them together to get a complex number. So now let's let's suppose for simplicity that D is equal to three. D equals three, and that we want to exploit this. We want to compute what Z does on manifolds of dimension three by cutting them along surfaces. Well, the first thing that we need to understand is what um, Z of M looks like where M is now a closed manifold of dimension two. And now what happens in a lot of interesting examples, including quantum turn simons theory, is that there's a similar kind of formula for uh, how do you extract Z of M if you cut M into pieces. So let's say now M is, um, some surface of genus two, and I wanted to sort of chop it into two pieces by cutting along some circle here. Let's say in practice, uh, one can often associate the circle, um, I don't know, let's call it S, to S on category Z of S. And this S is here, it's cutting this two manifold into two pieces, M minus and M plus. And these pieces M minus and M plus determine objects of this category Z of S. Maybe Z of M minus is an object of the category Z of S and M plus maybe you should think of as an object in the opposite category. It's kind of the same thing. And then such that the vector space that you're actually interested in Z of M can be thought of as Homs from Z of M minus to Z of M plus in this category Z of uh, 
TFS. So this is uh, analogous to what was happening up here, but it's one step more abstract. Right here, we were trying to compute a number by taking an element of a vector space and an element of the dual vector space and combining them. Here, we're trying to compute a vector space by taking an object of a category and an object of the opposite category and combining them using the structure of the category. That'd be z of m plus dual uh, or z of m plus bar with the opposite orientation? Um, well, yeah, maybe I should. Uh, confused. Right. Yeah. So is the dimension of the world manifold, you are trying to apply this to the spatial manifolds or? To the, so let's say d is equal to three. Um, so to every surface, one of these gadgets assigns a vector space. Right. Uh, so it's not part of the TS axioms. The TS axioms won't tell you anything about how to compute that vector space. But in practice, you often have more than what was axiomatized by a TS. Yeah. Uh, I'm reluctant to interrupt, but I think if I explain what this means for transignments, mm -hmm. this is this might understand you better. Yeah, so go for it. I'll do that for a second. So first of all, in transignments theory, you've got a gauge group. And when you construct Z of M, M is a Riemann surface, you impose the gauge theory constraint. And so there are functions of the connection that are gauge invariant. Now, suppose you want to build M out of two pieces. You can't completely impose the constraints on either side because then you won't be able to reconstruct the whole answer by gluing them. Instead, what you do is for one piece, you impose only the constraints by gauge transformations that are one on the boundary. When you do that, you get a vector space, but it's much, first of all, it's infinite dimensional. Z of M for a compact surface is finite dimensional. It's an infinite dimensional vector space that has an action of the loop group because you didn't divide by the gauge transformations that were non trivial in the circle. So for uh, the complete M, you have this simple finite dimensional vector space. But for the two pieces, you have infinite dimensional vector spaces, each of which have an action of the loop group. I think when uh, Jacob says opposite category, you can think of one as having level K and one level minus K. And then when you glue them together, you can write the invariance. And the invariance, I'm worried about that's actually analytically correct in infinite dimension. Maybe Jacob would criticize that. But roughly speaking, the invariants are the finite dimensional vector space. That you have. So, 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 just to say one more yeah. thing. So, the, an object in the category in this case is not just a vector space, but a vector space with the action of the loop group. So, so from your point of view, Jacob, this yeah. category was completely something else. It's, it's a third thing. It's not related to the categories we were talking about before. Well, let's say quantum turn Simon's theory has this additional feature, which is not encoded in Atiyah's axioms. And that additional feature is, is interesting. And maybe we could now try to enhance Atiyah's axioms to encode that too. That's what I want to say next. Maybe that's not your question. Um, well, in, in, in Edward's explanation, the, the, this additional thing, which was this loop group in the middle, then, mm -hmm. well, it was, um, it was somehow related to the topological filtering we had in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, here, here, it looks like you're adding some other structure, some other category, which is the. Mm -hmm. Well, if you like, he's going to axiomatize the assumption that topological field theories always like transignments. For the example of transignments, I explained to you why this structure exists. Right, like it, Jacob will incorporate in the axioms that it's always like that. Maybe the term topological quantum theory, theory is evoking for you something that has more structure than a TIA axiomatized. Okay. Um, so if um, that explanation of what you were assigning to the circle sort of made sense as something that should be there then Atiyah didn't uh, include that. So it needs to be... Uh... Yeah, what confuses me is that the, the, the thing that you have in the circle is perhaps some additional, perhaps vector space or set of variables. Well, or maybe call the match mode or something like this. Category doesn't do it. <laughs> 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 but you don't you don't want to think of it as a category. 
when they it's, it's the set of highest weight representations of the current algebra. You could think of it that way, Z of S, at least the objects in Z of S. There's a loop group that has a Lie algebra, which is your current algebra of level K. They have highest weight, rep they have unitary representations, highest weight representations. Z of S, the objects in Z of S are the, the unitary representations of that loop group of that current algebra. Right, perhaps it would help me. So, so you have this category. What are the objects and morphisms of this category? In, in, in the trans Simon theory example or in general? In the trans Simon theory example. Uh, uh, there's the category of positive energy representations of a loop. Uh, well, you know, if you fix a particular level that you're interested in but, but, studying. Why is that the category? Sorry. sorry. Well, there's a, a notion. In general, if representations of a group forms a category, because if I have two representations, I can talk about a linear map between them that preserves the action of the group. The linear map is just going to be the vector. The, the cobordism is a Riemann surface with some boundaries. And the turn signs level is considered positive on some, negative on the others, which are considered incoming or outgoing. Okay. And the vector space is getting the, the map, you say, from that intertwines between the different representations. So, so let me try to incorporate this into Atiyah's definition. So let me, I'll give something which is stated a little bit informally. So a once extended CQST, dimension D, is a rule. And now, at this time, let me start my rule at the top. It assigns, uh, it's a rule Z which assigns to any closed um, D manifold, I'm going to call it M now, violating my earlier convention. Any closed D manifold gets assigned a complex number. Any closed D minus one manifold, um, let's say, I'll also call it M, gets assigned D of M, now a complex vector space. Um, but now what I associate to, let's say, the same manifold with the opposite orientation is going to be the dual of that uh, complex vector space. And what I assign here, well, is an additional um, structure that relates what happens at this level to what happens at this level, that if... Um, Let's say now if B is a D manifold with boundary, then you can assign to it a um, vector that I'll write a Z of B, which lives inside uh, the complex vector space that you've associated to the boundary. And now there's a compatibility between the data that you see at these two levels and the data that you see at this level, which is that if you're in a situation where you've, um, let's say, you have some big manifold B and you've cut it along a co-dimension one submanifold into two pieces, B minus and B plus, well, then the invariant that you want to assign that big manifold of dimension D, that's a complex number. You want that to be obtained by taking these vectors, Z of B minus and Z of B plus. And these are elements. One of these is an element in Z of M. One of these is an element in the dual space. And you pair them together. So, so far, this is the structure that you see when you have a TQFT in the sense of a TIA. To say that it's extended, 
But once extended is to say that you also have data associated to manifolds one dimension down. So if M is a closed manifold of dimension D minus two, and you're going to associate an object Z of M, and now this is going to be something Every time the dimension goes down by one, the nature of the object that you're going to assign gets a little bit more abstract. At the top level, you were assigning something very concrete, namely a number. At the next level, you were assigning something a little more abstract, a vector space. At this level, you'll assign something like a category. So Z of M is going to be C linear category. Um, maybe changing the orientation should essentially not change that category, or maybe it should replace it by the opposite category or something like that. And then this B is now a D minus one manifold with boundary. And you can associate to it an object, which I'll write as Z of B. This is now an object in the category that you associate to the boundary of B. And you have a, a compatibility similar to this of what's happening on this line and what's happening on line two. Namely, if now M is a manifold of dimension D minus one, or sorry, if B is a manifold of dimension D minus one and you've cut it into two pieces, well then you should be able to compute Z of B, which is now a complex vector space, by taking these objects, Z of B minus and Z of B plus, and pairing them together somehow. And in this case, the somehow means you consider Homs between them in this category Z of And so I said, this is an informal definition. Did I misspell definition? Um, what is the monoidal structure on the categories? Are you taking what? The monoidal structure on the, 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 I mean, there's a monoidal structure. If I think of this as a, maybe I should say here, uh, sorry, is your question, what replaces uh, the fact that this is compatible with tensor products at yeah, yeah. So what is the category to get to a disjoint union of M's? Right. So um, so let's say that you're, the categories that you were interested in, you could write as the category of representations of some finite dimensional algebra. Then what you would do is tensor the algebras together. Um, so there's, there's an intrinsic way to describe so, this. And, uh, so if, it, in general, it's the Deline tensor product of the categories? Or it's... it's well, I have to say exactly what kind of categories that I want to allow here. Um, if you're working, you might want to work with categories that you think of as sort of small categories made of finite dimensional objects. In that case, you have this notion of the Deline tensor product that requires some assumptions uh, in order to have it be defined. So you would include those assumptions in the definition. Uh, you might interpret C linear category as uh, to mean something that could potentially be quite large, like the category of all complex vector spaces, in which case there's a sort of companion tensor product, which can be defined in a lot more generality with the caveat that uh, you might take the tensor products of things that have lots of finite looking objects inside them and the tensor product category would no longer have that feature. But let's not dwell on uh, technicalities of exactly um, what I mean here, because the specifics of the definition are, are not going to, or the specifics of what the target of a TQFT is, is not really going to figure into the, the rest of what I want to say. Actually, how long do I have? Oh, four minutes. <laughs> um, well, let me say that this is an incomplete definition. So, there should be, or this, this should be supplemented 
by lots of additional, let's say, gluing rules. The gluing rules should tell you not just what happens when you glue together, um, let's say, a closed manifold out of two pieces along a common boundary, but it should also tell you what happens when you glue together a uh, manifold of dimension D as a union of pieces that are manifolds with corners. And uh, so in the non-extended case, we could summarize the TS definition not by writing out exactly um, exactly what the gluing rules were, but using the language of, of category theory, we could say there is a bordism category, and what a TQFT is is a tensor functor from that bordism category to the category of complex vector spaces. And there's something similar that you can do here. So let me try to make this informal definition a little bit less informal. And let me go back a little bit. So remember at the very beginning of this lecture, I introduced this category Cobb D. This had as its objects both manifolds of dimension D minus one. So let me describe a variant or a generalization of this construction. So fix a um, closed D minus two manifold X. Now let me define something, let me call it Cobb D comma X. So this is going to be defined like Cobb D and it's gonna coincide with Cobb D when X is empty. And so this is a category whose objects are D minus one manifolds M with boundary X. And what are the morphisms? Well, what we said in the, um, in this case, is that morphisms from M uh, to N are manifolds B, bordism, which are bordisms from M to N, meaning that the boundary of B is uh, identified with the disjoint union of M with N. And here we're going to do the same kind of thing, but we don't take a disjoint union. So if M and N are two manifolds that have a common boundary, then I can glue them together along their common boundary to make a closed manifold. So morphisms from uh, M to N are now D manifolds B where the boundary of B is identified not with the disjoint union of M with N, their union along X. And now I want to observe that there's a, an additional structure here, which is that, uh, let's say, let me continue using X and Y. If X, Y, and Z are closed manifolds, of dimension D minus two, then there's an operation that goes from Cobb D, um, let's say X bar U Y to cross Cobb D, Z, and Cobb D, X bar, Z. 
which is well, an object here is a vortism from x to y. And an object here is a vortism from y to z. And as before, we can glue these vortisms together to make a vortism from, uh, from x to z. So this is given on objects by the construction that takes a pair of vortisms m and n and makes, um, let's say, m union along y with n. So there's some mathematical structure here, which is made out of manifolds of dimensions d, d minus one and d minus two. And it encodes um, the ability to both to sort of glue along manifolds of dimension d minus two and manifolds of dimension d minus one. And this sort of mathematical structure that you obtain is something that has a name. So this, uh, this gives you, this gives an example. Category. Let me call this uh, plus D. So the objects of this two category are closed manifolds of dimension D minus two. And well, morphisms, what it means that this is a two category is that instead of having a set of morphisms between two closed D manifolds or two objects, you have a category of morphisms. So the morphisms um, from X to Y is this category that I'm calling Cobb D X union Y. And so the reason that I'm saying this is because it's a convenient way to make precise the definition that I was sketching very informally before, which is that uh, definition, a, uh, let's say, a once extended T. Of dimension, again, I'll say of dimension D. And now let me say with values in some target category C, target two category. This just means it's a tensor functor, now not of categories, but of two categories from this uh, plus of D to the category C. So here, this C, what kind of gadget does it have to be, it has to be some two category with a notion of tensor product. Let's say with a tensor structure. Okay, so I've already gone over my time and I did, definitely did not reach my point. Um, but why don't I just close by, I think you should go on for a little bit. Okay. okay. So C was not a. I expected C to be a category of vector spaces or something. It's an unspecified two. Well, it's going to be a two category. In order to be related to the definition that I gave earlier, this two category should have a feature that when I look at endomorphisms of the unit object, I should get the category of vector spaces. Um, but you have some freedom as to. What, uh, what you can take that two category to be. So a common choice is to take that two category to be something like the objects to be something like C linear categories. And then you have the question uh, that was asked a, a, a little while ago, what's the tensor product on those? And in good cases, there's this uh, Deline tensor product on categories with good finiteness properties. And uh, if you, if you don't want to assume, make a lot of assumptions, there's ways of sort of getting around needing to make them. So if, if D is equal to two, then yeah. extending to um, Cobb plus D looks a little bit like you're introducing open, uh, what physicists would call open strings, right? The objects are points 
the one yeah. that from the intervals, those are the open strings, and then the then the morphisms of morphisms with roll sheets. One of the big motivations uh, for Mike Hopkins and I when we started thinking about this was reading this uh, paper of Kevin Costello about sort of classifying these open closed uh, theories in, in dimension two. So, okay, so this is the notion of once extended theory. And so what do you lose and gain by passing from uh, ordinary TQFTs to these once extended TQFTs? Well, the definition became a lot more complicated, right? If the definition originally, if you write it down um, category theoretically, you need to know what a category is and you need to know two examples of categories. You need to know the category of manifolds and vortisms and the category of complex vector spaces. Um, but for this definition, you need to know not just what a category is, but what a two category is. And you need to understand at least how to make manifolds into a two category. And also you have to decide where you want your field theory to land and understand uh, you know, what, what the structure that you wanna see over there is. Um, so you, you pay a cost in the level of abstraction that you're working at, but pays a dividend, which is that in some sense, the theory becomes simpler. So uh, let's say a, a theorem, I think this is a recent theorem um, in full detail, but uh, let's say it essentially goes back to Reshetikin and Turayev is that, um, A, uh, a once extended TQFT um, of dimension three, let's say with, the, with values in C linear categories properly interpreted, is the same data. A uh, modular tensor category. So in the early 90s, uh, Reshetikin and Turayev uh, gave a recipe for starting with the data of a modular tensor category, which is a particular structure that you expect to see as the value on a circle of one of these theories. And they gave a recipe for starting with that data and reconstructing three manifold invariants. And I think uh, it wasn't until quite recently that this was sort of put uh, put a, uh, or made, made precise in the language that I'm describing now, saying that there was actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between the data of the modular tensor category and the data of a functor of two categories in this sense. Uh, I have one question. Semi-simplicity is not important for these statements, right? Uh, well. Modular tensor category is a semi-simple category. Um, and so uh, so semi-simplicity is, is sort of not assumed, but in order to have one of these, uh, or let's say you don't input that the value on the circle is uh, semi-simple, but it's something that is forced on you by the axioms of one of these fully extended theories. It's analogous to what we saw you know, in Atiyah's definition, you could have made that definition without assuming that your uh, field theory when evaluated on a D minus one manifold was a finite dimensional manifold, but the axioms actually force that upon you. Um, and so these sort of general theme is these axioms force the values of your theory to be, have very strong finiteness properties. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question about that. This is something that I've always been rather confused about. Yeah, you can write out in it going back to D equals two, where you have closed strings and open strings. You can write out the axioms for the open closed uh, topological field theory. And um, I know that from from your your work, there's there's a proof that the Frobenius algebra, the commutative Frobenius algebra has to be semi simple. But you can write down, you can write down examples of open closed topological field theories where the Frobenian algebra is not semi-simple. 
for example, if it's a it's the Duram cohomology of some compact manifold. So I, I there, there seem to be two different kinds of open closed uh, topological quantum field theories, at least in dimension two, and I don't see why that shouldn't why something like that can't extend to higher dimensions. So this this is something I've been confused about for a long time. So, so I don't know why you say that but something has to be semi-simple. I mean well I mean uh, I thought that followed from your axioms. I mean there it's certainly it proved in detail in in papers like lecture notes by Pavel Safronov and I've discussed this with him at length. And so um from, so from, from your formulation, there is definitely a statement that in D equals two, the fully extended two-dimensional TQFT has- I think it has to do with whether or not you're thinking of the, the values on points to be uh, algebras or, or differential graded algebras. Like certainly if you allow differential graded algebras, there's lots of things with strong finiteness conditions that don't make the algebras look semi-simple. Okay, in that case, the uh, the uh, Frobenius algebra of the circle would not be uh, semi-simple. Right. Well, well, like I mean, one example is um, that you uh, like the Frobenius algebra that you assign to the circle being. Right. That that's what that's what I'm asking about. I think Hassan was might have had that in the back of his mind in the question he just asked. Right, so these examples that you're thinking about having to do with the rom -com like well, one example that you can do is, you know, the, the B model. You can take your, your favorite smooth projective algebraic variety, and then the category that you assign is really, uh, really some kind of derived category of coherent sheaves on that variety. And then that's a category that has the kind of finiteness properties, assuming that the variety is smooth and proper to be able to build one of these field theories. And when you evaluate on the circle, you get something that you should really think of as a, a differential graded algebra rather than a uh, rather than a rather than thinking about its homology. And when you think of it as a differential graded algebra, it has some very strong finiteness properties that are not necessarily visible at the level of its homology. Sorry, I think I've. Now I'm cutting into tea time, so I should probably stop. That's why we could stop here. Yeah. All right, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. More questions for Jacob? So the pair of pan picks, pair of pass picture you drew in two dimensions. Uh, if you think of the same picture in three dimensions. In, in a once extended TQFT, uh, is this is the uh, so in two dimensions this gave you the structure of an, of an algebra, so in three dimensions this would give you the modular tensor the, the tensor structure on the so category. So you're drawing with the usual pair of pants. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that's what's responsible for the tensor product on your on the, tensor okay. category. I just want to say a word about why uh, it's a pity we interrupted Jacob so many times we didn't hear the, the next 10 minutes, because I think you probably would have told us about the next step where you would have extended to a point. Yes. In the case of a three manifold. And that might have been of interest to the audience because um, when you extend it down to a circle, you had a loop group representation. Now you're trying to factor, would then be trying to sort of, in some abstract sense, factor it into two pieces associated to the pairs of the circle. It's analogous to looking at a state of a quantum field on the two sides of the buckle horizon. So what we didn't hear, because of interrupting Jacob a little bit too much, <laughs> would have been more analogous to a lot of the stuff that's discussed in the school currently. Well, you wouldn't have heard about anything that's specific to that example, although there is some work about, about that that's quite recent. Well, we would have heard some kind of abstract. You would have heard some abstraction of what, what you were looking for. What would accomplish the goal of yeah. bringing it down to a point? Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe you could say a few words about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, why don't we take a, a one minute or, you know, a five minute break and, you know. Yeah, maybe we let people go. No judgment about who comes back and who doesn't. Okay, let's move back in five minutes. <laughs> 
I was asked the outcomes of the A three D TQFT, the tricky for which you have to them because we're going to be looking for But that's not what we're going to do. I think we talked about this last time. Like alternative way. I was talking about that. Is there a point of that? I once knew what that was, but I forgot. I spoke to the axiom of the carrier. Let me speak clearly what's the difference. It's a theory associated with hyper theater model. But it's very similar to a truncated version of Trinitarian theory, in which you, in physics language, you expand the power of the some low terms. Right, so then I wouldn't have so you get type two. But I'm not sure you get the full modular. So it's a three-dimensional theory? Yeah. So it's a three-dimensional theory that it's similar to, but should be should be drastically similar to the Certainly these ones are just well not associated to a surface. But as Anthony and I said, I don't remember very well, but it's something instructed in elementary way. On the homology of the surface yeah, of the common, which I remind you is the hyperkeller one. Should I say that again? There are two manifolds in the yeah, the surface of the hyperkeller. Right. The answer to your question is associated yeah, like, I would with the same way. But, the, yeah, unfortunately, the, the for example, if the hyperkeller manifold is a K3 surface, mm -hmm. then what you associate with it? The low, the deep levels won't be excited. A three manifold. Let's say a simple. Connected three yeah, 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 exactly. But three manifold is first by a number of zero. But is it canceling? Uh -huh. Which is a, a fairly non trivial invariant. But with the excitation, the small excitation part of the top. Not as like probably not as. Our understanding is the invariants that come from. I was trying to wonder. You know, you're saying that even so making it a once extended thing is. Uh, well, it hasn't been once extended. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but it's not a I don't know. It's not a triple. What are they doing? Even a T is axioms. Was asking Isaac to explain how to satisfy it. Was asking Isaac to not completely explain how to satisfy even a T is axioms. I don't know what's been done subsequently. There's, there's, I'm sure there's some papers by uh, Roberts. I think what, in my understanding, they constructed uh, the category of lines, which is what you would assign to a circle. And this uh, uh, for for witten theory. So they they constructed something analogous to the modular tensor category of turn times when you start from a. So they may have once extended it. Tonight. Yes, okay. and I mean the twice extended stuff is is is. Is Kapustin Salina with sorry, Kapustin Salina Rosansky, isn't it? That's the two category. That's the fully extended version, as far as I understand. Okay. It's probably not been put in this framework. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So there you go. Okay, so let me say a word about um, what would be the purpose of making this definition is that um, you know an extended theory first of all it's it's a more complicated to define what it is um, and therefore it's maybe harder to give it, find examples of them but it's easier to sort of control the amount of data that you need to specify because of a, a statement like this um, one of these once extended things at least when valued in c linear categories is determined by the modular tensor category that you associate to the circle. And the data of a modular tensor category is something that um, you, know, you can contemplate independent of the geometry of manifolds. You can try to write down examples of modular tensor categories that come from purely algebraic constructions. And then by this um, Russian tikhan Turayev business, you can then take something like that and couple it to this kind of theorem and extract invariants of three manifolds from it. 
Um, so there's a sense in which thinking about these extended TQFTs is simpler than thinking about um, TQFTs in the sense of a TF, um, in that they're sort of determined by maybe a smaller amount of data. As the terminology suggests here, something that is once extended can be further extended. And so I don't want to, um, I've already been somewhat vague about exactly what the definitions are, but um, maybe a little, let me continue in that vein. A fully extended topological quantum field theory of dimension D uh, is going to be a similar datum, but now instead of a functor between two categories or ordinary categories, it's going to be a functor between D categories. Let's say D is some, uh, C is some D category with a tensor structure, then you can consider a tensor functor from, why don't I call this Cobb D fully extended? Um, from some D category, which is defined entirely in terms of manifolds. And so let me just describe this very informally. Cobb D fully extended to some category where the objects are manifolds of dimension zero. Morphisms, morphism between two objects is a vortism. So in particular, it's, it's a one, one manifold with boundary. And well, there's some notion of morphism between these things, which is if you have two one manifolds with a common boundary, you can glue them together and then try to write that as the boundary of something two dimensional. So let me informally summarize that by saying, you know, boardisms between boardisms. So these are some certain kinds of two manifolds with boundary. Maybe you want to think of them as having corners and so on. And the D means we stop at dimension D. So there's D morphisms, which are given by D manifolds with boundary. And saying that I'm viewing this as a D category means I'm keeping track of a bunch of uh, data which describes how such objects can be glued together to make other such objects. And there's a philosophy, which was, I think, first proposed by by as in Dolan, which is that this notion should be a very simple one. So let me um, this is what they called their cobordism hypothesis. And the informal statement of this, a very informal statement is that um, these fully extended theories are very easy. Maybe I should say they're easy to classify. Um, and I want to just very briefly indicate why this is true in the one case we can actually think about without engaging with the theory of uh, with this notion of higher category. So I want to do the example when D is equal to one. D is equal to one, then fully extended. is the same thing as a TS definition. This definition in D is equal to one involves zero manifolds and one manifolds. And well, there can't go any lower than zero. 
And so Atiyah actually discusses this case in his paper in one paragraph and just remarks that, of course, this is very easy and entirely trivial. Let's just see why that is. Um, so, all right, a one-dimensional TQFT in the sense of Atiya, it's something that you need to be able to evaluate on manifolds of dimension zero to get a vector space. Now, my manifolds at the beginning, I said we're all going to be oriented. So manifolds of dimension zero are just collections of points, but orientations means I need to keep track of whether a point has a positive orientation or a negative orientation. So here's a picture of a typical manifold of dimension zero. Well, if I take Z with the values in a positively oriented point, that'll be some vector space V. And this determines what Z will do on a negatively oriented point because of the lemma that I proved at the beginning, namely that when you reverse the orientation of a manifold, you pass the dual space. And then because this is supposed to be a tensor functor, that will tell you what Z has to do on this manifold here. It needs to assign V tensor V star tensor V star. Okay, well, we're not quite done because we have to say also what Z does on vortices. In other words, on manifolds with boundary. But a manifold, since we're interested in tensor functors, if we wanna know what it does on a disconnected manifold with boundary, that's determined by what it does on each of its connected pieces. And well, there's only a couple of things that a one manifold with boundary can look like. Um, there's essentially five pictures that you could consider. So you could consider a sort of bordism from a positively oriented point to a positively oriented point. If you assign the identity of V, you could consider a bordism from a negatively oriented point to a negatively oriented point, which would be assigned the identity on V star. You could consider a bordism from a positively or positive union negative to the empty set. This would be assigned the evaluation map from V tensor V star to the complex numbers. Or you could assign, you could read that the other way, in which case you'd assign the, the co evaluation map, which lands in V tensor V star. And the only really interesting case is what you assign to the circle. That's a bordism from the empty set to the empty set gets assigned a number, but you can compute it like before by breaking the circle into a Northern hemisphere and a Southern hemisphere or an Eastern and a Western in this picture. And what you'll learn is that the number that you get is the one that you get by composing the evaluation with the co-evaluation. And that's just the dimension of the vector space. And so what we see in this example is that actually everything is determined once you know V. And so let me turn that into. So I'd like to ask a question. So if we if we consider the unoriented case, yeah, we'd have a vector space with uh, hold that thought. Let me uh, let me say that at the end. That, that that's going to play into what I'm going to say next. Let me give an incorrect formulation. Um, of this bias dolan cobordism my hypothesis. So you can consider the collection of extended, fully extended CQFTs valued in C. And if you have such a TQFT, then what you can do is just evaluate it on a point. And then you'll extract an object of whatever this um, target category C is. So roughly what they wanted to say was that uh, this was a bijection, that if you have any object of C, it completely determines this um, fully extended TQFT. So this is incorrect for two reasons. And one of those is something that you can already see in dimension one. 
So in dimension one, on the left-hand side, we're interested in TQFTs. On the right-hand side, we're talking about vector spaces. It's not true that every vector space can be come from a TQFT in this sense. A TQFT is determined by the vector space V, but in order to have this co-evaluation map, V has to be a finite dimensional vector space. So what you actually learn is that first of all, the evaluation map, um, it behaves more like an injection and the things that it hits, well, let's say the image is um, well, what we call the, the collection of fully dualizable objects. That's the image of the set of theorems. What's that? The, the image of the set of fully extended PQFTs. Right. So in order for an object to be the evaluation on a point of a fully extended TQFT, it has to satisfy a certain finiteness condition that in the world of vector spaces means finite dimensional, but in a general N category with a tensor structure, it's a, well, it's a finiteness condition that we, we gave a name to. And so the correct formulation is that this, this is true provided that we, um, we think about TQFTs, which are defined, I said at the beginning, there's several variants of the definition of TQFT, depending on how much structure you want to equip your manifolds with. You can think about unoriented manifolds or oriented manifolds or um, spin manifolds or whatever. And in this analysis, we were assuming that manifold meant oriented manifold. Now, if we meant unoriented manifold, then we wouldn't be able to distinguish between a positive and negatively oriented point here. And we would learn that we needed more data than just a vector space V. We needed a vector space V that was identified with its dual. And maybe the question was gonna be, um, are you allowed any identification? And no, it has to be identified with its dual in a symmetric way. It has to be identified with its dual via a non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. So in dimension one, if we were interested in unoriented theories, this statement would not be quite right. You would have to see fully dualizable objects that had some kind of um, additional symmetry. And in higher dimensions, well, the statement is correct provided that you think, you think about manifolds equipped with the maximal amount of structure that makes sense on a D-dimensional manifold. So TQFTs are defined on well, what I'll call D-framed manifolds. And what I mean by that is that when I'm thinking about D-manifolds, they have to come with a trivialization of their tangent bundle. And when I think about D minus one manifolds, they have to have a trivialization not of their tangent bundle, but of their tangent bundle plus a trivial bundle of rank one and, and so on for lower dimensional. Okay, I think this is the end point that I wanted to reach. And uh, why don't I stop here? I can take questions again for five minutes and then I need to run. All right, let's thank Jacob again. Could you just draw some of the pictures that you would have to confront in D equals two? Just to do something there. That hang it, you mean so, but that so you would confront to, to set up a fully this, this maximally extended, this fully extended object? You need, uh, you, oh, you mean like what? You need what structure is encoded and, uh, in, in saying that something is a thumb? Yeah. Um, right. So. So you would say something like this. So anytime you have a manifold with dimension zero, you have to assign an object of whatever your target category is. Um, and now, um, anytime you have a bordism, so, so let's say we're valued in C linear categories. So a point gets assigned some C linear category, and then 
Um, this gets assigned a tensor product of four different C linear categories. This gets assigned a tensor product of two C linear categories. And typically a, a bordism might look something like, um, like this, and maybe it has some additional component. And so every time I see a datum like this, I have to see a, a functor between those C linear categories. And now there's, there's two senses in which this uh, has to vary nicely. So one is that if I regard the endpoints as fixed, there's a notion of bordisms between bordisms. So every bordism is supposed to get assigned a functor, but every bordism between bordisms is supposed to give you a natural transformation between those functors. And those have to, you know, uh, that has to be compatible with, with gluing, uh, with gluing the bordisms with fixed endpoints. There's another structure. So that's like um, what they would call the, the, the vertical structure of the two category. But there's another structure, which is the horizontal structure, which is I could consider also, so that had, that, the structure that I just mentioned, it had only to do with functors between two fixed C linear categories. I was never composing functors between C linear categories. But now, um, oh, let's draw it like this. I also have the ability to compose these one dimensional pictures. Each of these one dimensional pictures gets assigned a functor. And when I stack them next to each other, the functors are supposed to compose. And well, everything is supposed to be true up to isomorphism and the isomorphisms have to satisfy some coherence conditions. But uh, that's, that's the structure that one of these so two- it's the, the two manifold plays a role in the, in the previous thing you were talking about, about the vertical structure? The two manifold, right. right. This, this uh, horizontal structure mentions only one manifold. Although, but there's a compatibility between the horizontal structure and the vertical structure, which is that the, this is telling you that you have some, there's actually some category of bordisms, which goes to some category of linear functors. And this composition is, uh, So a point should go to an object in a two category, right? Yes. Okay, and so the morphism between two points should be, it should be, a, I mean, I, I think a physicist would call, if I understand well, a physicist would call the, the morphism between the two points, the open string uh, state space. It should be a vector space, right? If I take, if I take curly C to be the two category of, Well, maybe it's algebras, bimodules, and um, bimodule morphisms. Right. So, I mean, a physicist would like to call the the the, the what you assign to yeah. your one morphisms between the, the zero morphisms is the open string state space, and then the the two morphisms will be just the the, the amplitudes from open and closed strings and going and out going to open and closed strings and going out. I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> One final question. Um, so if I, if I think of examples of uh, categories, uh, let's say boundary conditions. There's a standard, uh, there's a canonical example of the Fukaya category. Uh -huh. So that's not a C linear category, but an A infinity category. Right. So is there a way to, that doesn't quite fit into the axioms you. Right, so I, um, I stated this for N cat or D categories when you're interested in D dimensional TQFTs, but there's a, an enhanced version and actually the, the proof is by induction and the induction needs the enhancement. Um, there's an enhancement where um, you know, your, your target is really, or let's say your domain is something that keeps track, not just well, what, what you, if I had uh, continued, I had some very rough definition of what the source category here is, right? Of like made out of manifolds up to dimension D. And what I would have said there is the D morphisms 
you've specified some D minus one manifold, which is uh, has to do with what the source and target is. And then you want to write down D manifolds whose boundary is that D minus one manifold. And if I had been careful, I would have said the morphisms are diffeomorphism classes of those objects. But there's something fancier that you could do, which is to think about the collection of those things, not the, the set of diffeomorphism classes of manifolds with that boundary, but some kind of classifying space for all the uh, compact manifolds having that boundary. Like, and then uh, that's an object that forms an object that I would call a, an infinity D category. And it makes sense to talk about functors from that into a target, which is an object of the same nature. And you have the same theorem there. And the kind of thing that you're talking about is the kind of thing where you, you would need that level of generality because these A infinity categories, you know, uh, like a natural transformation between A infinity functors, there's, you shouldn't really think there's a set of those. You should think that there's a, um, you know, like a chain complex of those. There's uh, the sense in which these things form sort of non-trivial families parametrized by moduli spaces of, uh, well, I mean, in the case of the Fukaya category, there's, two, there's a two-dimensional TQFT associated to that. And you see interesting invariants of like moduli spaces of curves coming out of that story. Yeah, I think we, we ate enough of Jacob's time. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you.